Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, my name is Akash Goel. Um, I'm currently the Chief Fellow at the Stanford Division of Pain Medicine. And starting this August, I will be an Assistant Professor at the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine in the University of Toronto. Um, originally an anesthesiologist from Toronto, and I've come down here to Stanford to learn more about pain. Um, and today I'd like to talk to you about a topic that's very close to my heart. We're gonna talk a little bit about how social connectivity, the relationships that we have with those around us, um, how our neighborhoods, where we live, and even uh, our you know, day to day surroundings and interactions with individuals can affect our experience with pain. What I'm hoping is that by the end of today's 30 or 40 minutes, uh, you and your loved ones will get a better understanding of how your interactions can affect your experience of pain and what we can do to help each other at home and in our uh, social networks. So before I get started, I'd like to touch a little bit on acute pain and chronic pain. So acute pain is essentially an alarm system to alert, alert us to danger. I want you to think of a, a time where you maybe stepped on something sharp or maybe you put your hand on, on the stove top where it was a, you know, there was something hot and you immediately pulled your hand back or you immediately pulled your foot back from this painful or hot object. You probably recall your heart rate going up a little bit. You probably recall your blood, you know, your blood pressure may be going up. You may feel, you may have felt this sudden fear response. And that is because your fight, and, your fight or flight response has essentially been kicked in. And this is designed to protect you from danger, but it's also designed in the acute healing period after an injury to protect you while you heal. So you don't continue to, con continue to re-injure a part of your body. This response needs to be unple unpleasant. It's undeniably unpleasant because the idea is that you don't ignore it. And it's undeniable that there's an emotional response associated with this pain. Now, when this alarm system goes off beyond the initial danger or it continues to progress for months beyond the initial injury. This is when this alarm system, this acute pain becomes chronic. And much like anything else, like diabetes, heart disease, this system, it becomes a disease in and of its own right. And what's more interesting is that like any other disease, it becomes a matter that is important, not only to the patient, but to their loved ones and their family members whose lives are so intricately tied to this disease. So what I propose is that there really is no choice other than for our loved ones to understand this disease, because without the understanding, we really are unable to validate our loved ones and empower them with the tools to succeed. So just like a diabetic who is insulin dependent and needs their family to understand the warning signs of what does it look like when I have a high sugar or a low sugar, in much the same way, a chronic pain patient needs to have their family, their friends, their network to understand the triggers the signs and the symptoms of their chronic pain. So what I'm gonna to propose to you today and what I'm gonna take you through is some of the evidence, some of the studies that have been done to show why this is important. And I'm gonna give you some tools to help your loved ones out at home. So many of you probably heard a little bit about the biopsychosocial model of pain. Basically, any disease can probably be defined in these three realms, the psychological, the social, and the biological realm. So take any disease, and we're going to talk about chronic pain in this realm. The biological realm is the idea that there is a, there's a physiological pathology. There's a disease process that's going on 
And that's the chronic pain. But there's also a psychological aspect, which is basically the thoughts, the emotions, the behaviors associated with that disease. So much of the psychological distress, the fear and avoidance behaviors, that plays in to our understanding of this illness. And lastly, and this is what I want to focus on today, are the social aspects of any disease process. This includes things like the socioeconomical effects, the socio-environmental interactions, cultural factors, work-related issues. So for example, what, what's going on at work, your relationship with your boss, um, any stressors within your family, um, any financial circumstances that may play into your overall perception of your pain experience. And it's really important to touch on some of these things. So this year, actually last year, the IASP revised their definition of chronic pain. And they added an important feature, and I think it's worth touching on this shortly. They define it as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with or actual or potential tissue damage. The key here, what I want you to focus on is the emotional experience. And I think if and all of you can probably relate with me right now. If I were to tell you that there's a significant component of our chronic pain that is tied to our emotional experience. And what the IASP spe specified was that pain is always a personal experience that is influenced to varying degrees by multiple factors, but also the social factors. And it's through your life experiences that you can learn the concept of pain. And so these life experiences, they're not just when you're an adult or when you, or what happens in your spousal relationship. It could be something that happened to you as a child. It could be something related to your upbringing. It could be something related to your experience at work or in friendships. So it's really important for us to now recognize that that we, we see how, how wholesome this definition and our understanding of chronic pain is. So what is social support? And you know, this has been talked about in many circles, but there's two parts to the idea of what social support is. Social support is, is, is an idea that encapsulates not just what is received by the patient, so not just the act of kindness or love or, love or um, the physical act of helping one way with, say, getting to their doctor's appointment or, or obtaining their medications, but it also encapsulates the perceived support. So how does the patient feel about their interactions? How do they feel about the acts that are being done for them or, or with them to help them in their day-to-day -day life? This is a really important point because I think too often as the caregiver, we don't think about what our loved one is experiencing. And so often the easiest question to ask is, what would you like and what can I do better? And those are some of the questions and conversations I'm gonna to touch on in a bit. Before I proceed a little bit more and get into some of the studies, which I think are fascinating and really worth touching on, I thought it would only be it would only be proper if I just took a second to address the epidemiological basis for some of these studies. So you can see how there's a possible study that was designed where they looked at 100 people who all had yellow fingers. And what they noticed is as they followed them for 10 or 15 years that all these folks with yellow fingers all developed cancer. But what the scientists failed to address was that all these folks with yellow fingers, they were also smoking. And so the yellow finger was just an intermediate or a sign of something else that was going on. It was a smoking that was probably what was causing the cancer. And why is this important? It's important because as we understand and look at studies that, that assess the importance of social support and how we interact with our family members, 
it's important that we correct for some of those obvious confounders. So in this study, couples participated in a lab discussion task that was designed to stimulate critical and hostile behavior in speech that might then be related to subsequent pain. So what happened was patients and their spouses were independently asked to list five things that they would like to see their partners change about the way they responded to or coped with the patient's chronic pain. And one of these items were then chosen as a discussion topic. So you can imagine that a spouse and their partner speaking about what they would like the other one to change about how they respond to, to my chronic pain would obviously lead to a fair amount of criticism or, host, or hostile behavior. And that's what, these, that's what these authors saw. They saw that there were certainly hostile interactions, but also critical statements that were being given from one spouse to their partner. The partner with chronic pain was then asked to undergo a pain-inducing exercise. So they were asked to basically take part in an activity that would typically cause them pain. And what they found is that in couples where there was an increased level of criticism or hostility, when this, part, when this partner underwent a pain-inducing task three hours later, they actually experienced more pain. But you can also imagine why criticism or hostility would potentially lead to increased depressive symptoms. And we know, this is well described, that mood and depressive symptoms has a role to play in pain intensity. Well, what these authors showed is that when they looked at all these couples and they corrected for the depressive symptoms, they were able to, able to definitively show that criticism and hostile behavior at home leads to increased pain intensity. So what they showed is that criticism and hostility influence pain. And what they suggest in this study is that we target the couple's behavior in the context of the chronic pain with an emphasis on critical and hostile behavior. And so one of the key recommendations they make is, is actually talking about your pain with your spouse, because this can actually increase one's feeling of validation and marital quality. And I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna touch on validation shortly and talk about why that's so important. But one of the key features they talk about is that validation specifically requires mindfulness, tolerance, and an acceptance of one's own, own emotions. And so you can quickly see why this becomes a very emotionally intense task for both the patient with chronic pain, but also their loved one. So before we get into some of the strategies for how you might be able to help a loved one, I thought I would share some really cool data about why it's important to help your partner. There's a couple of studies, and actually there's a lot of literature, especially in the domain of cancer and the domain of diabetes, where they've looked at caregiving. I, they've looked at the outcomes, the health outcomes of the family member at home who is taking care of the patient with the disease. And what they've shown is that caregiving is actually associated with positive effects. It's been associated with lower depression, greater self-esteem and lower stress for the family member who is providing care. And it's also, it's also associated with a, almost a 20% reduced rate of death compared when comparing caregivers to non-caregivers. So this is really important because I want you to, I want everyone who's here to understand that helping someone in your family or helping anyone has been associated with positive effects. And that's, if, no, if there's no other reason, that's one reason to think about what you can do better for your loved one. Some of you might've heard about this term called solicitousness. And, and solicitousness basically describes our historical understanding of how we can help someone in our family with chronic pain or with any disease for that matter. Solicitousness is the idea of a feeling of excessive concern. So it's the idea that if I show excessive concern, if I perhaps give my partner a day off because they're having a particularly bad day, or if I say, maybe I can, you know, honey, maybe I can get you your meds for you today, or maybe I'll 
I'll do a certain task instead of you. It's this showing of excessive sympathy or concern. In some patients with a disease and in some patients with chronic pain, being on the receiving end of this type of emotion can be perceived as unhelpful because they might feel that it undermines their self-esteem, their self-worth and autonomy. And so what the current literature would suggest is that it may be helpful to ask your partner, how much empathy would you like me to show you? What tasks do you particularly need help with and what can we do to help you get to the level that is important for both of us? Until now, the underlying assumption has been that showing empathy, an excessive amount of concern or empathy or solicitousness to your partner is perhaps positively reinforcing their pain behavior. So in other words, if I show excessive concern to my partner with chronic pain, they might start behaving more like a chronic pain patient. But the evidence until now shows that that's not necessarily true. What I do want to differentiate, however, is that while solicitousness is the idea of showing concern, it's very different from the idea of validation. And I'm going to touch a little bit about uh, touch a little bit on the importance of validation and how we can start differentiating our behaviors at home from that of solicitousness to that of validation and problem solving and empowering our partners with the tools to succeed. And I'm going to give you some great suggestions at the end of this talk. So the important thing here is to determine what your partner or your loved one's perspectives are on their pain-related social support interactions. So what are their needs? What are their preferences? And how satisfied are they with the care they're getting? So you can clarify the role of that demonstration of empathy, that solicitousness. You want to understand how valuable that is to your partner or your loved one. So validation is the idea that there is an interpersonal process through which one individual communicates to another that their experience is understandable, accepted, and makes sense. And what we know is that validation of one's emotions and their experience leads to less negative intense emotions for that patient. Validation overlaps in some ways with compassion because there is this sharing of certain elements like acceptance and empathy and non-judgment. And what we know is that being able to demonstrate compassion for your partner or your loved one at home with chronic pain necessarily will correlate with a positive pain function on their end. I want to speak a little bit about shame and guilt provocation because I think it's important to realize that we can make our loved ones feel a certain way without necessarily outwardly saying critical things or being hostile towards them. I want you to imagine a scenario where, for example, you have you and your partner who has chronic pain are planning on going on an outing, say, with another couple, maybe a dinner. And your partner has a flare of chronic pain on that one particular day, and they're not feeling up to the task of going out for dinner. So you get on the phone and you speak on the phone to this other couple, and you know that your partner with chronic pain is listening. And you essentially say on the phone, well, you know how it is. You know, my partner has, you know, it's one of those days, I don't think we'll be able to make it again. You, it's not my fault. And you can see how this kind of behavior would potentially make your partner feel guilty or ashamed. And that would be despite you necessarily puni you know, punishing them or showing excessive hostility or directly criticizing them. So the importance of this slide is, is really to show that shame behaviors are independent of punitive or punishing behaviors at home or direct critical or hostile comments that you can make to a partner. This is really important because it's, it's often the missing part of the puzzle. Um, and, and these kinds of interactions are what we can sometimes target to, to improve the overall experience for everyone. 
So here's some kind of statements that that patients might relate with when they think about their interactions with, with a loved one. They might think something along the lines of, when I'm in pain, I feel that I can or cannot express my emotions, or I feel that my suffering does or does not make sense to others. People get angry at me when I can't do certain activities due to my pain. People criticize me for having pain. Or maybe people judge me negatively for not knowing how to cope with my pain better. Yeah, and you can clearly see from my example before that without even any outright behaviors that would suggest that passive behaviors may make a loved one feel judged and feel that sense of shame. Another example, when I'm in pain, people tend to be harsh on me. On the other hand, there are emotions that are more correlated with validation that certain patients with chronic pain might relate with. So a couple of examples here are, people understand and accept the limitations that the pain causes in my life. Or in my difficult moments of pain, people are supported and caring. Or I feel that others are available to do whatever it takes to help me cope with my pain. When I'm in pain, people tell me that, tell me things that validate my suffering. In other words, an example would be, I can only imagine how tough and difficult it is that you are feeling this way. Or when I'm in pain, I can see through their body language that people accept my pain. So one of the key points here is that there's a difference between solicitousness and problem solving. Solicitousness is the idea that in response to communications of pain or distress, a family member might express sympathy, or I might excuse my, my loved one with chronic pain from their usual, responsibility, uh, usual responsibilities. But this is somewhat different, and I'm, and I'm hoping that we can shift our paradigm and our way of thinking now from this idea, and not that this is necessarily a bad idea, but how can we empower our loved ones to be successful? How can we empower them to do the tasks that are important to them? And how can we show them the right type of emotion that is important to them on a daily basis? Problem solving is, is this new paradigm that I want all families and loved ones to really start thinking about. It's basically empowering our loved ones with an approach that will allow them to create solutions to all stressful life situations. And what we know is that folks and families and relationships in which there's a greater degree of problem solving ability, necessarily these families and these individuals have less depressive symptoms, they have less chronic pain, and they're more successful. So once again, just shifting from the idea of solicitousness, uh, an expression of extreme empathy, maybe excusing one from their regular tasks to problem solving, empowering them to succeed. And moving away from this idea of perceived criticism, again, the emphasis on the word perceived here, because what's important is not what we do, but how we make our partners or family members feel. And moving away from this idea of perceived validation. There's some other great studies that talk about the importance of social support and, 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 and there's some scientific work that's being done to understand why it is that social support actually helps to reduce someone's pain experience. So we've talked about the evidence that supports the idea that our environment and our relationships can have an impact on our pain experience. And I think everyone would agree with that, but it's worth touching on some of these mechanisms. So in cases where individuals with chronic pain feel well supported, they actually perceive a reduced threatening quality of their pain. And simultaneously, they also feel, an, feel a perceived increase in their coping ability. And so what we see is because of that reduced threat response, there's a reduced fight or flight response that kicks in. And so there's less of that endocrine stress response. There's less steroid, there's less of the catecholaminergic response. Not only do they have reduced stress at the level of their central nervous system, but physiologically, 
they experience less stress. And as a result of that reduced stress, their pain experience is diminished somewhat. So the whole idea here is that in the right support system, a patient with chronic pain on a physiological level has a basis for experiencing less pain. And this is very exciting that we have research that shows this work. In this study, and this is one of my favorite studies actually, pain, volunteers were actually given painful stimuli in one of three interpersonal contexts. So they were basically playing a virtual game called Cyberball. And basically there were three, there would be three players and each player throws the ball to another player. And there are three conditions. There's an acceptance condition and a rejection condition. Condition. And we're gonna talk about those two conditions. In the acceptance condition, every player has the same chance of getting the ball. But in the rejection condition, you only get the ball 10% of the time. So you can imagine a game where maybe you're throwing a Frisbee around with three friends and two friends continue to throw the Frisbee back and forth with each other and only 10% of the time do they throw it to you. What was interesting about this study is that in, in folks who were in the rejection group and they were subsequently given a painful stimulus, there were MRI findings in their brains that would suggest more fear and more pain. And when they looked at these patients to try and understand what might have led to this predisposition to an increased pain experience, they actually found that lower levels of parental care in their childhood might be contributing to this adult experience. And this is really important because I wanna bring it back to the idea that pain is a lived experience. It's not something that we're necessarily born with all of our life experiences can affect the way that we perceive pain. So patients with chronic pain can seemingly have no specific trigger or pattern to what constitutes a good day or a bad day. To loved ones, it might seem that their flares are triggered by nothing in particular. But a closer appreciation for your loved one's disease will maybe help you understand what their triggers for chronic pain flares are. So an example of this might be perhaps a bad night's sleep on a day that was particularly stressful, or perhaps there was a day where your loved one had to do a little bit more work to make ends meet at home, and so they maybe took 10,000 steps instead of 8,000 steps. And the reason I bring this up is because I'm a huge fan of a data-driven approach to how we can care for our family members and each other. In much the same way that a diabetic might monitor their blood sugar on a minute-to-minute on -minute basis to understand what kind of food, what kind of sleep, what kind of diet, what kind of exercise affects their sugar, in much the same way, I highly encourage all of my patients, all of my families to start collecting data on their smartphones, on what kind of activity they're doing, how their sleep patterns have been, how many hours of sleep they got, how many hours they were awake for, what they ate. Because what we know is that not only is pain a physiologic state, but it also is quite clearly affected by many, many things, including what's the overall state of inflammation in our body? How much did we push ourselves on a certain day or how badly did we sleep? And one of the things that, that you can do as a family member is actually start encouraging your loved ones to collect this kind of data. And not only can you just encourage them to collect this kind of data, but you can actually share data and follow their data. And when you, can, when you start seeing trends on what, what types of activity, what types of diets, what types of sleep levels lead to a worse day or a flare of someone's chronic pain, it'll also help you understand their experience and will help you predict and anticipate a bad day or a good day. And it will make this whole experience shared, which I think is completely fundamental to being able to empower our loved ones with the tools they need to succeed.
So caregiving is a good thing. But more importantly, empowerment is perhaps more important than solicitousness, the idea that you can show, show extreme emotion or empathy for someone. It's incredibly important to validate your partners, your family members. Not only is it important to validate, but it's also important to show compassion. And, and, and pain is a family matter, just like any other disease. If we all group together, we can overcome it. And that's the, that's the message I want to transmit today. Some great resources on the American Chronic Pain Association website, it's a family matter, have, have some videos for family members, spouses, and also children um, to help you understand the overall pain experience. I highly encourage all of you to visit this website and check out some of these videos. They were highly informational for me. And I have left some of my references here for everyone to peruse. I'm absolutely available to answer any questions. And it's been a real pleasure to be here. I can't thank you enough for having me.